Hello everyone, welcome to Life Questions, a brand new TV show that's all about your questions. I'm Bill Harris, your host, and we're going to spend the next 30 minutes looking at life issues from a perspective that just might change your life. During his time on earth, Jesus spoke of life issues, telling his followers, in this world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Well, how do we overcome the world and not let it overcome us? Well, before we dive into that discussion, let me first introduce our panel. First, Pastor Brandon Green of Calvary Chapel of Praise in Lima. Secondly, Pastor Kim Lyons, who along with her husband, Michael, also pastors the uh, In Faith Ministries also here in Lima. Next, we have Pastor Tim Benjamin, formerly of um, Forest Park United Methodist Church, a new assignment now, pastor of Wayne Street United Methodist Church in St. Mary's. And finally, Pastor Damian Tibbs. He's pastor of New Life Christian Ministries, also here in Lima. Guess we're partial to Lima, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> we're happy to have you all with us today. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Now, we, we invite pastors because of all the other ministry types that we have, you know, the five-fold ministry, the, you know, the, the, the evangelists and the teachers and the apostles and the like, you folks are down in the trenches every day with the believers. Let me ask you a question you no doubt may have had to deal with, but I want the audience to hear this because some of our folks out there have these issues. You know, the, the, the Bible talks about there's going to be tribulation in the world, but Christ said, be a good cheer for I have overcome the world. Listen to this. Here's a woman who says, I raised my children to love the Lord, but they have chosen their own path. I am brokenhearted as a parent and want them to come back to Christ. That's, doesn't that kind of grab you a little bit? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What, do you, what do you say to a mom like that? Proverbs 22, verse 6 is so familiar to so many people. They've stenciled it on their baby's nursery. And it does not say train up a child in the way that he or she should go. And in the end, they will not depart from the church. <laughs> but I believe the implication is as you've trained and you've instilled truth to them, no matter where they go in life, that truth will never leave them. Mm -hmm. They may be crying in a beer at a bar somewhere and that truth resonates on the inside of them. It will not leave them. Mm -hmm. All that you've invested and instilled into them is still something that will stay with them for all of their yeah, life. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very powerful. Yeah. So it's a witness that just keeps on witnessing to them, yes. even yes. In, in their simple ways, you're mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. You have to yeah. trust the word to work. And yeah. so you have, to, uh, you have to trust God. You have to uh, continue to pray over them. And then you have to remind yourself that you had your own journey. Mm -hmm. There was a yeah. timing when God shifted your life. And, you know, our oldest kid, he's 36 now. And he, uh, you know, had a drinking problem. He always had, he was... I don't know how many DUIs he had and you know it troubled us and we prayed and uh, made sure I had a prayer partner and a prayer team and mm -hmm. I fast and I prayed but I held on to the word because I know the word works mm -hmm. and then later maybe a couple of years later he's in church he's serving he's doing well he's <laughs> awesome. in Atlanta Georgia ah. and so I have the testimony of knowing that the word does work yes. if you train him up it will speak to him mm -hmm. at that appointed time though mm -hmm. yes I had a perfect upbringing, uh, being raised by a, a pastor. Um, you were P.K. Yes, 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 yes. So um, was trained up, but still after I graduated from high school, I went my own way. And I explored everything that my mother and father told me to stay away from. But then I had that moment that the prodigal son had. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what training does for you, that you're able to come to yourself. Yeah. So yeah. although I might have lived on the other side mm -hmm. of the laws of man and God, he still had a purpose for my life, and now I'm a pastor and a police officer. Yeah. Mm. So it, it goes hand in hand. Uh, yeah. Something Pastor Kim said is, and, and my, my pastor here too said, once you train them up, yeah. also pray for them. Mm -hmm. I had a praying grandmother, a praying mother, a praying father uh, that continued to pray for me while they knew I was not living the way that I was trained. So that's mm -hmm. very key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. and, I, and I think one of the things that we sometimes confuse is we kind of confuse everything going exactly how we want it to go yeah. with being God's will. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
Name the biblical character who didn't run into problem at some point. There's not good one. Good point. Good point. And I think sometimes we look at it, look at it, you know the next generation and we think, well, they're messing this up or this has gone wrong or this is happening bad. We interpret that as them doing something to cause it. Well, I invite you to hear what Job's friends said to Job. You know, sometimes bad things happen and we get off course and we cope with it in negative ways. All that's part of learning. Mm -hmm. And while we don't like that. Those are the lessons that stick with us the longest. Yeah. Yeah. And they have to have their own personal relationship with God. Right. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, want, you, want, you want to pray for them, you want to train them, and then you want them to walk uh, in the Word right then. But they have to come to know the Lord and their weakness and, mm -hmm. and their fear. I mean, they have to cultivate this relationship yes. with God mm -hmm. on their own. And that's what you were able to do. Yes. You right. came to know Jesus yes. for yourself. Right. It made your relationship mean that much more. Yeah. It, it does. Jesus. And something I tell the people all the time is that he uses is our story yeah. for his glory. glory. Yes, it does. Mm. You he know, does. you've got to, the beauty of a lot of the cleaning products is they show you the dirty shirt first <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then the clean shirt. Yeah. Very yeah. good, yeah. very yeah. good. I, I think pastors want relief from pain and they yeah. want that instantly. You know? yeah. I think yeah. parents want relief from pain yeah. for their children. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very difficult to watch your child struggle. You want to help them, mm -hmm. even when they're babies, yeah. you know, they're, they're trying to walk and everything on the inside of you is just like, oh, would you just stand up and, yeah, you yeah. know, don't fall over that, yeah. you know? So I, I find that just as pastor said, God will take the mess or the misery and turn it into a ministry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, living up to the expectations of our parents, if, if you've been a child that you've been wayward, that's a very hard place to live, mm -hmm. to, to let your mom and your dad down. And so I find that it's very important to continue to affirm what they are doing mm -hmm. right yeah. mm -hmm. and who they are in spite of what you see yeah. because yeah. there's a destiny that is greater than what you're seeing even now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Neither of my parents were saved at the time that I got saved at age 15, but my grandmother was saved and mm -hmm. taught me about Jesus on her knee from five years of age. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that never left me. Like I yep. said, as I went into the world doing mm -hmm. my own thing, yep. it continued to stay with me. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is, how can we equip our churches? How can we equip our congregations to be in support of parents in raising these children? Because mm -hmm. obviously they go into a world, a secular world out there, and for much of their waking hours during the day in school, in that environment and the like, some precious time with their parents at home during dinner, and then once a week perhaps, uh, Sunday school and maybe church on a Sunday. How can we as a church make an impact? Well, I think one of the things we run into is we forget that this is not the first time this has ever happened. Uh, every generation has been concerned about the next generation, clear back to Adam and Eve being concerned about Cain and Abel. I mean, it goes sure. back that far. And I think uh, if we could have generational ministry where we have the previous generation saying, you know, we struggled with you guys when you were kids too, and, and, and here's how we coped with it and look at you yeah. now. Mm -hmm. I think that would be an encouragement to people. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, wagging our finger and saying, <coughs> You know, here's a list of 100 things that you've done wrong. Say, take heart. These things get better. And, mm -hmm. and, and encouragement to hold on from somebody who's been there. Yeah. Yeah. Something I'm trying to do better myself, um, and I don't know if some of the other pastors struggle with this, is sometimes so much of our passion and energy and strength is given to the church that we have to also remember to be the priest of our home yes. as well. Yes. And so that's how we help the church yeah. because we only meet for an hour or two per week, mm -hmm. You're right. but you have a sanctuary at your house at all times. Yeah. So that's why we yeah. have to equip them to that's be right. able to teach their children mm -hmm. and, 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 and worship even at home. Mm -hmm. Jacob was a, um, a paralyzed parent in many ways. He didn't deal with his children. But you know, the blessing began to unfold as he went back to Bethel, to the house of God, and he took his whole family. He said, we're all going to leave behind our idols and we're all going to seek the face of God. And so I do believe that revival begins in the home by rebuilding the family altar. Mm -hmm. So it's not always easy because I grew up with nine children in the home. So you've got the baby struggling while mom's trying to give the devotion and dad's trying to pray. But I just continue just, some things are better caught than taught as well. So I'd rather see a sermon than necessarily sometimes hear it in the uh -huh. home. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Very good. You know, I, I do a seminar on marriage and family life and, and I've often taught that the husband, father, is to be the prophet. That is, he represents God before the people. Yes, sir. And he's also a priest. He represents the people, his family, mm -hmm. before God. Yes. And he's the king of his home. Mm -hmm. Not a 
a benevolent king, mm -hmm. not a bully, you know, saying, honey, bring me another sandwich, mm -hmm. you know, not that kind. Mm -hmm. And the children comprise this kingdom. Mm -hmm. Do you see a need for encouraging men, men, to stand up and be men in the home? My God, if they stay, you need to celebrate the fact because men don't die loud, they die quietly. And so I find that sometimes- What do you mean by that? Well, if you look at depression, there are more men that commit suicide, you know, in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s, and they just go away and they just disappear. Or they commit spiritual suicide and they just get quiet within, they no longer have a voice. Your wife needs to hear you speak and declare. Your children need to hear you speak and declare. And sometimes in the frustration that wives have, they need to celebrate the fact that he's still here. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't leave. And I need to pull from you. I need to hear more from you. I need to hear your heart. Very good. Yes. I thought somebody wanted to add to that. Well, you know, many men, I don't know, it's, it's, it's maybe they can, take, they can take the lead in some areas, but they can't in others. You know, mm -hmm. typically, and I don't mean this to berate men, I'm one, but <laughs> sometimes we as men, we can bark and roar out loud, but then when it comes to follow through, you yeah. know, there, there's nothing there. Um, and we, isn't there a need for the man to be taught in the gospel what leadership is all about yes. in the home? Mm -hmm. He needs to be prepared for that, you know? But he needs to be prepared by other men, you mm -hmm. know, uh, whether they be fathers or grandfathers or, or paternal people from his church or whatever. That, that, that's where those things are. That's where I learned it from. I mean, no, no class taught me how to, you know, grow up or whatever. I think a lot of that was example from my dad and things like that. And I think that that's, that's what we're missing is a lot of the, the generational stuff. And we talked a little bit about that earlier was about how some of the older, older generation in our churches can be mentors to young kids, mm -hmm. especially boys. I think that would be huge totally. to help, now, to help have, them grow up. In our ministry, we have a men's group. And I'm sure, I'm not sure if all the other pastors, I'm sure you do, but these men meet like once a month and they deal with real men issues. Mm -hmm. And not only do they, and it's been a, a great forum for men to come together and to just be transparent and to, to just share what their struggles are because that's, that's a large portion of the problem. They have this internal struggle going on and because they have such pride, they don't know how to be vulnerable and share. Mm -hmm. See, women, we share in a minute. Yes. You know, we'll be in a grocery store, that's, laundromat, pastor, you know, folding clothes. Pastor, that's why you all live longer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, you, you get it off you. Yeah, you get we it do. Off you. But right. men, they keep it in because because of how you wired how mm -hmm, you you know mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I think if you have more men support groups even if it's not at the church if it's someone's house if you yeah, have a cookout yeah, yeah. have a forum where someone yeah. can come and and be vulnerable to share without you judging them yeah, then that could help yeah, a lot yeah, of men yeah, I think I recall the scripture when um, after David had had his affair with Bathsheba mm -hmm. how that began to run rampant through the family and before yeah. you know it one of his sons Amnon raped his sister, or yeah. yes. David's yeah. daughter, mm -hmm. Tamar. The Bible says that David became angry about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, okay, David, is that all you're gonna do? Yeah. Just to get angry? Uh -huh. Are you gonna do anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're not the king in the home, so right. to speak. We mm -hmm. just don't take the action that right. we should yeah. to. Mm -hmm. When we know we need to step across and say something and do something to make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, what's at stake is mother's kisses and mother's milk is is so important so important but it takes a man to make a man yes and that man if he has seen a silent father in the home or a passive yeah. father like yeah. david was in those instances and didn't deal with things head on it'll just can continue to create dysfunction mm -hmm. yeah. within the home yeah. Yeah. i would see where mentoring or the, the term we call it in the church is discipleship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would really be necessary to help bring that kind of uh, situation uh, about, for, to have stronger men in the home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it takes a, a, a man to teach a boy to be a man. It takes a yeah. woman to teach a girl to be a woman. And that is not to say that a woman can't raise a son. Oh, right. My mom right. raised me in That's large right. part. Mm -hmm. But I thank God that just before my mom and dad separated, that's when I got saved, and the pastor of that church became my father. Because yeah. there had yeah. to be a man yeah. in yeah. my life, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's God's way. Yeah. Which is. leads me to my next question. 
It appears to me, you tell me what your views are, it appears to me that the family in this country, the definition of the family is being redefined mm -hmm. right before our eyes, is it not? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Speak to that, if you will. How do you feel about that? What, what's yes. happening? If we don't stand up and say something, if we don't allow the truth of the word of God to be made known, then they have nothing to compare it to. If the first time you're hearing about a family is the way that the government defines it mm -hmm. or someone else defines it, then that's, that, you'll accept that as truth when it might not be the truth at all. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to be a voice for the Lord and the voice for truth that says, no, this is wrong and this is right mm -hmm. and we can't the church cannot be confined to being politically correct because mm -hmm. we we uh, adhere to a truth yeah. that is above all law yeah, that's right in 1979 yeah. i testified before the white house conference on families I, I was in television news at that time and i said that wherever this country is headed to on the road to moral decline families will be the first to get there mm -hmm. it's foundational families weren't created by congress or an right. edict of the supreme court yeah. or an executive order from the president mm -hmm. why if, if we're getting away and we're redefining the family as we are now there's there are families where there are two men instead of a, a husband and a wife mm -hmm. where there are two women again instead of a husband and wife or mother and a father these children are coming up with that viewpoint they it are. becomes the norm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that do to a society ultimately, a generation or so down the road? What does that do? The reason it's been made possible is because, speaking of vacuums, uh, the Word of God was vacuumed from the schools and vacuumed from society, and now it's easier for the enemy, the devil, to uh -huh. come in with his lies, because he's the father of lies, mm -hmm. to establish his lies as truth. And we'll see that there's just great dysfunction when things are out of godly order. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I go back to the point where rebuilding the family altar is so paramount, especially when they're receiving conflicting views or ideas. I was watching Judge Judy one day, and, uh, you know, she kind of tells it like it is. And <coughs> she was taking uh, these teenage girls to task and their mothers for some inappropriate behavior at school. And she looked at the mothers and she says, it is not the job of the institution of education to impart morals and value and truth into your child. It's up to you. So whether there's a man in the home or there's not, we've got to get back to talking, having conversations around dinner time mm -hmm. and really connecting and instilling truth because we are in a place where it's ambiguous at best. Instead of doing this. Well, yeah, that's what everybody's you know, doing. Dinner yeah. Table. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, this should be banned from the dinner table. You know, when I was growing up, we we had family. I mean, dinner yeah. together as a family. Yeah. You know, I had to set the table and, yes, you know, yes. it was just an order that we had. And and whether we liked it or not, it, it, it didn't make a difference. And, and we talked, you know, whereas now technology. You know, it takes the attention of our kids. We mm -hmm. let our kids eat in their bedroom, on the floor, mm -hmm. by the couch, so they can watch their face. So we do need to bring some things back in order. Yeah. order. And you I know? think the dinner time is, and I realize there's the pressure of yeah. the kids being involved in activities. games at school and mm -hmm. all those, all those oh, activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the dinner time to me, I have five kids, and when I was raising them, that was a platform for me and my mom, their mom, yeah. to instill some values. I used to do talk talk, chalk talks. At the dinner table. Mm -hmm. after yeah. that. that was my time to get my point across. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, good. and you know, when you when kids are eating, when anybody eats, mm -hmm. you as you start to digest, your guard comes down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I found that as a time when my kids begin to tell on themselves. <laughs> a lot of times. And I wouldn't, you know, rebuke them about that. Right. But you know, you you get some insight yeah. Yeah. into yeah. what's going on in their lives yeah. during mm -hmm. the day as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just need to, we need to get back to that dinner yeah. mm -hmm. Well, one of the other problems that we're running into is kind of a corollary problem to this one is the idea of instant gratification. Everything that happens is about gratifying me. Yeah. And, and I think that that has translated into marriage and in that I, when somebody gets married, I mean, I meet with a lot of couples as I'm sure you guys mm -hmm. do too. Uh, what they want to talk about is how this relationship yeah. fulfills me and how I feel better and mm -hmm. how this person is incredible and I'm better because, right. and all this stuff. When I think the institution of marriage was actually set up to raise children, that was the point. And uh, that, you know, rarely ever comes up. And sometimes, you know, if I got a couple who, you know, the rare instance, if you'll pardon me, a bit a little sarcastic here, the rare instance when I have a couple who comes once to get married who don't have kids yet, and I'll ask them why they want to get married, that doesn't come up. It's not like we're trying to, trying to create a situation where we're, we're raising children and investing in the next generation. 
So that's why we it's sit about at the, them, huh? Yeah, right. That's why you sit at the dinner table and you play on your phone, mm -hmm. or you don't ignore, or you, or you, you know, want to just take care of your kids when they're doing well. Is because those moments make me feel better, or yeah. somehow serve me, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. not the point at all. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the, I mean. Paul was extremely clear about marriage. It's about sacrificing yourself for the betterment of the oh, other yeah. person. Yeah. Yeah. He made it, I mean, it couldn't be more clear. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and somehow we've gotten away from that where everything now serves me and mm -hmm. I can get my, you know, my hamburger at McDonald's in less than a minute and all this mm -hmm. stuff. It happened so fast, this instant gratification, that that's not what it, it's not even about that. Mm -hmm. Yet that's what we've made it about. And I think that's where the breakdown happens. A lot of men are frustrated because they want and it's such a dirty word in the church. They want their wives to submit to them, but they offer no mission to submit to. <laughs> and what I find is Ephesians 5 talks about the husband laying down his life yeah. for his wife. Oh, yes. If oh, you'll yes. submit to your head, yeah. it's easy for it her is. to submit to her head. So it's on both parts. The submission is actually on both parts. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Submit yeah. one to another. And it was yeah. such a countercultural message when Paul wrote that. Oh, sure. I mean, it was so, I mean, yeah. even more than today, it was against the way things were totally. normally practiced. And uh, sometimes we lose how, how con I don't know, controversial is the right word, but how radical that teaching was. Yeah. But how um, we're still struggling with it yeah. 2,000 years later. Yeah. 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 I want to get back to another part where I was going to lead the conversation to, and we, we went another way, which was fine. But I want to get back to this issue of homosexuality in, in our society today that is becoming more and more, quote unquote, relevant and real. Mm -hmm. How can we, as ministers of the gospel, convey the truth of God without being called or, 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 or looked upon as being homophobic? Mm -hmm. How do we do that? How do we convey these truths without appearing that we are hateful? Mm -hmm. because, because we, we hate them because of we, we continue to define the relationship of marriage in the way we've always defined it. it is a platform to raise children period and I, and I think um, I mean obviously there's a lot of relationships out there that don't aren't going to result in that homosexuality being one of them and I think in those situations that uh, we we stick to our guns and say hey this this is how we define it this is what it is the government or anybody else can't redefine that for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, sh should people be able to, uh, you know, be in domestic partnerships in the eyes of the government? Probably, because the marriage doesn't belong to the government, it's ours. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have something like that, fine, you know, do it legally, That's whatever. Choice. Mm -hmm. That's your choice. You know, society, all we have to say about it is there has to be some kind of consent, which means, you know, an adult can't marry an eight-year-old or something right, like that. Right. So there has to be some standard of consent, but once that's met, the government can recognize whatever it wants, but don't don't take our thing away from us because it was ours first. Yeah. And, and I think a part of that argument, too, is that if you make that decision to live that lifestyle, that's fine. But don't push that on my kids or my grandkids. Right. Don't right. teach it in, in, in schools as being normal and natural. Mm -hmm. right. And I got a I, we got a comment here from viewers. God made me gay and Although, his, how is that a sin, it says, if God made me this way? Sexual attraction does not identify you. God does. Exactly. And so, you know, we, there's this misnomer that everyone is created in the image of God. And, and follow me with this thought for just a moment. Yes, in the garden, God created man in his image. Right. But then the fall came. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible says this in uh, Genesis 5.3. And Adam had lived 130 years. Mm -hmm. He had a son in his own likeness. So we mm -hmm. lost the image of the father. Yeah. See there. And yeah. so through Jesus Christ, he's wow. come to restore that image. Mm -hmm. And the more that I let go of my mind, my will, my way, my warfare, my worship, I can have more of his mm -hmm. and I can come into that order yes. and that likeness that we were intended before the fall came. Yeah. Where was that scripture again? Uh, Genesis 5.3. Genesis yeah. So what we're dealing with mm -hmm. is a sin problem. Yeah. It's sin. Yes. Um, I have never taught my children how to lie. I've <laughs> never sat them down and said, here's how you lie. But yet I've been lied to, but I never yeah. taught them that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just because we are born into sin. We're yes, born into this sinful condition. Mm -hmm. So whether your sin is lying or homosexuality or whatever, whatever, it, uh, yeah. whatever it is, it, it needs to be dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is how lives are transformed. Mm -hmm. So we look at homosexuality, you know, um, as a sin, of course, but what about fornication? Right. You know, divorce. Or being a murderer, a liar, yeah. a racist. Yeah. You're not born that way. 
You just choose to be that way. It's a matter not, of choice. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, a matter of choice. choice. Yeah. And like the way my bishop put it, he said that, put it, you know, when there's a question about whether you are a male or a female, he says, you look down. If you see something, you know one thing. If yeah. you don't see something, you, you know, know something that. else. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as simple as that. Yeah. But millions of dollars are being spent. Laws are being changed. All of this to perpetuate a lie. Mm -hmm. You know, a lie. I'm, I'm in the middle of a teaching series on all about the feels, you know, which is in our vernacular, it's about emotions and responding. And there's this lie in our culture that says that I feel, therefore I am. But through Christ, we, we learn that we don't have to be bound by those feelings mm -hmm. or those attractions. Mm -hmm. It is choice mm -hmm. and it's a matter of mm -hmm. what is your will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned Ephesians earlier in a couple chapters prior to the one we mentioned a little bit ago. Paul says, if you're a thief, stop stealing. And one of the, and I just preached on this last Sunday. It was an interesting thing to think about. So if I'm not a thief, is it okay to steal? I think what Paul was getting to here, he says, look, don't give up. If you have this thing about yourself that you're unhappy with, yeah. don't just accept it. Oh, yeah. That's not yeah. how that yeah. works. Yeah. You know, you, you have the power to change. I mean, the whole tenet yes. of Christianity is transformation. Amen. That, that, that's why it exists. Right. And I think, uh, you know, do we need to be tolerant and loving? Absolutely, but that doesn't mean accepting. That's right. And even in ourselves. That's very well put. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Tolerant, but not accepting. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. well put. Yeah, there, there's no room for disrespect or hate. There, there's no, no room for that. No. Mm -hmm. But, but there is a, a, a thing to be able to say, don't take something that we've had for all this time and try to make it something it's not. Mm -hmm. and, and the Lord already told us that we're going to be hated. Yeah. Yeah. So, and anytime you call somebody out on their sin, yeah. you know, it's, it's going to be an issue for them. Anytime mm -hmm. you shine light into the, the darkness, darkness it's right. going to offend some people. Yeah. Yeah. But I go back to if I'm, if I'm trying to persuade you in whatever you're dealing with, if I haven't built rapport with you, mm -hmm. if I haven't shown oh, yeah. that I care, you can't shout from the street. Yeah. how can I, unless I build the platform and my presence is known, then I can proclaim what I want to declare right. to you right. mm -hmm. and you'll hear me. Very well put. So, so you, this is what you're teaching in your churches then? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. this, yeah. is, this is, mm -hmm. how, um, in what venues? I mean, across the pulpit in the, on a Sunday morning, or is it in Sunday school? Just personal. Or what? Just, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> remember, I had told you that I had a lady that come to church, and I, I could smell that she had been drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I hugged on her, loved on her, didn't call her out. Uh, the next Sunday she came, she I could tell again that she had that stench on her again, mm -hmm. and and I knew then God was letting me know she has a problem. Mm -hmm. I loved on her, and then the next time I dealt with it. You know, just one on one, I let yeah. her know I loved her, that in my past I had this situation and that God can deliver you and so forth. And loving, so I think loving competition. Loving. Loving. I think sometimes pastors can come off too aggressive oh and then that hurts the body yeah. because we have such conviction. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we, we really have this conviction yes. about the word and, and sometimes our approach sometimes our approach isn't always favorable for the outcome of others. Okay, well then you know, you, this has been a very good discussion, and I certainly hope it's, it's a blessing to those who, who, who watch. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see what the comments will be. <laughs> <laughs> next week. That, that's for sure, but we want to thank you all for being with us today. So until next week, I'm Bill Harris for Channel 44. We want to thank you for being with us today. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.